Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we are going to further our study of covering spaces. So looking back on everything we've done, we realize that the only non-trivial group which we've directly calculated for a fundamental group is that of the circle. And to do that, we used a covering space argument. We learned that the real numbers covers the circle. And that was the basis for everything else we've done up to this point. So if we want a further understanding of the fundamental group, we're going to have to delve deeper into covering spaces, and that's going to be the subject of the next two lectures. In fact, we'll learn so much about the connection between covering spaces and the fundamental group that by the end of this, you'll see that they're really uh, two sides of the same coin. So let's get to it. So let's remember a covering space is a topological space, x twiddle, together with a map from x twiddle to my space x, so that for every point x, there's a neighborhood of x, so that the inverse image of this neighborhood is basically a bunch of homeomorphic copies of the, the base neighborhood. Let me draw a picture here. The idea is that you have your space down here, u, and then you'll have u1, u2, and u3, and p takes these all down homeomorphically. Uh, so each u in this setup is called an evenly covered neighborhood. And each u i is called a sheet. So if P inverse of U has N sheets, so for here, here, for example, I have three sheets. It is called an N fold cover. Sometimes this is also called N sheeted cover. Or uh, in the case of N is equal to two, maybe you'll call it a double cover or a triple cover. So that's our setup. Now, let me show you a boring two-fold cover of the circle. Well, what I can do is take two copies of S1, and I can map this down onto S1 by uh, you know what what you would expect. I'll just draw a picture of what I mean. The inverse image of that little red piece here maps homeomorphically by the inverse image into these two copies of uh, the circle living above it. So in some sense, this is really boring. Like if you ever have a topological space X, then you can convince yourself that the disjoint union of X and X will always double cover X. And you can generalize this to triple covers for three copies of a space X. So what are we learning from this? Well, disconnected covers are just disjoint unions of connected covers. So for this reason, we just restrict our attention to connected covers. So we just look at connected covers, and if we wanted to know more, 
uh, about, say, the disconnected ones, we just take disjoint unions of the connected ones. So here's a more interesting twofold cover of the circle. So let S1 be complex numbers so that the modulus of this complex number is equal to 1, the usual thing. And define P from S1 to S1 by P of Z is equal to Z squared. So this just takes in a given point at angle theta and takes it to 2 theta. So let me just put that in parentheses. Theta goes to 2 theta. So here's a picture of just something P does. It maps this half interval. And if I look at all of the doubles of all of these angles, I exhaust all of the angles. And so this maps it to the whole circle. Now I want to show you that it's a covering map. And so I'm really interested in the inverse images. And you could work this out using coordinates. It's pretty easy, but I'll just maybe draw a picture. Here is a set. And the inverse image of this open set well, it's all of the points on the circle whose angle doubles to lie in that set. And so it's like down here, kind of half as big, and up here, half as big. So here is, here is zero, here is zero. So if this was like, uh, well, I'll let you figure out the exact angles, but there it is. And so this is a twofold cover. And it's a connected twofold cover. Now, this obviously generalizes. Here's an n fold cover from S1 to S1. It's just given by P, let me just call this PN, from S1 to S1, where, you guessed it, PN of Z is equal to Z to the N. So last time for this real number cover, we had this helix visualization, which helped us. Here's the equivalent version of that here. Uh, you can take the circle on the bottom. So here's your base space. And let me just draw in the threefold cover. So it's going to roughly consist of three circles. That's the boring disconnected cover. Now let me make this into the interesting connected cover, what I do is I just take each of these circles and connect them up in this cyclic fashion. So it's like a parking garage. I'm going around the parking garage and it takes me up. I go around the parking garage and it takes me up. And then when I get to the very top of the parking garage, it crashes all the way down. So for example, this red set here lifts to these three red sets. The thing on the top you can see is a circle as well. These intersection points aren't really there. They're just there for the as an artifact of the image. You could just imagine if you took three pieces of string and connected them up cyclically, you would get this circle. So that is a threefold cover of S1, and you can imagine how to build an n-fold cover for an arbitrary n. So let me remind you that there is a map P 
piece star from pi one of x twiddle, x not twiddle, into pi one of x, x not. And the map is just take a loop in x twiddle, map it down using p, that's a loop in x, and look at the homotopy class down there. What are the images of these maps? So for for P2, that is S1 to S1, P of Z is equal to Z squared, what are the images of loops? Uh, well, let's think about it. Uh, I take my circle and a generator is go all the way around here, right? But what happens when I map this down here to the base circle? Well, now I end up wrapping around twice. And what does that mean? Well, so the image of P2 star is 2Z. It's a subgroup of Z. And anytime I go around some integer number of times on my loop on the left, the map is going to double the amount of winding. So I always land in 2Z. Similarly, P3 star has image 3z. You should also convince yourself that if there's any loop that wraps around three times on the right, there's a loop on the left that maps to that loop. Okay, so let me remind you of one of the important properties of a covering space. This was called the homotopy lifting property. And it states that if P from X twiddle to X is a cover and FT from Y to X is a homotopy, and suppose F0 twiddle from Y to X twiddle is a lift of F0. Then this homotopy lifting property says I get a unique lift FT twiddle from y to x twiddle. So that means there's a homotopy of y in x twiddle, which projects down under the covering map to the homotopy in x. So when looking at a loop in x, The loop can lift to either a path or a loop. So let me just uh, scroll up a second here. Under this double cover covering map, the loop that goes once around the circle here, the lift of this blue loop, is actually just a path that goes halfway around. It turns out that this is very important for understanding the image of the covering map in the fundamental group. So that's the content of this proposition. The map P star from pi one of x twiddle, x not twiddle, into pi one 
of x with base point x naught induced by a covering map is injective. That's already interesting in its own right. Moreover, the image of the subgroup rather the image subgroup p star of pi 1 x twiddle x not twiddle in pi 1 of x x not so I would like some geometric description of it and here it is it consists of loops in x, x naught, which lift to loops in x twiddle, x naught, twiddle. So this gives a algebraic understanding of which lift, which loops in x lift to loops in x twiddle. It's the ones that come from uh, the image of this subgroup. Let's prove it. So suppose f0 twiddle from i to x is a loop so that F0 is P composed with F0 twiddle. So this is now a loop in X. And suppose that this is trivial in pi 1 of X, X naught. So what am I doing here? I want to understand the kernel of the map under P. I want to show that the map is injective. That's the same thing as sh showing that the kernel is trivial. So then there exists a homotopy FT from F0 to the trivial loop. And now we're in good shape to apply our homotopy lifting property. So by the homotopy lifting property, we can lift this to a homotopy ft twiddle of f0 twiddle. And lifts are unique. One such lift is the trivial loop upstairs, and so that's the only such lift. So since F1 is trivial, like constant, let's say, so is F1 twiddle, so F0 twiddle is homotopic to a constant loop. What did we just show? We took an arbitrary loop upstairs, F0 twiddle, and if it happened to project down to a trivial loop, it itself was a trivial loop. So P star from pi one of x twiddle, x not twiddle to pi one of x, x not is injective. Now, how about for the second part? If a loop f from i to x lifts to a loop 
f twiddle from i to x. Well, I want to say then then clearly p star of f twiddle is in the image of p. So if a loop lifts to a loop, then projecting that lifted loop back down is a loop in the image of the covering map, right? Now, how about if we lift to a path? Well, let's maybe prove the, the contrapositive. If f twiddle from i to x is a loop, then p of f twiddle lifts to the loop f twiddle. Of course, this is once we specify that p inverse, we have to, the homotopy lifting property says once you fix base points, there's a unique lift. Uh, so once we specify that p inverse of x naught equals x naught twiddle. So, okay. If a loop lifts to a loop, it's in the image. And if it's in the image, well then just lift it back up. That's essentially it. It's almost tautological. So it turns out that just that little bit of theory is enough to get us a bunch of interesting results. And these results are gonna come from analyzing the covering spaces of the wedge of two circles. Coverings of S1 wedge S1. Uh, so remember that S1 wedge S1 looks like this. And let's also give these loops names. I'll call this loop here oriented loop A and this loop here B. And recall that pi one of S1 wedge S1 is free group on two generators with a basis given by the homotopy class of this loop A and the homotopy class of this loop B. Now, what would a cover of this space look like? Uh, over any of the edges of this graph, it would look pretty standard. It would just look like an interval. But the interesting thing happens at the vertices. So at the vertex V, let's call this thing V, uh, a covering space must have a collection of disjoint four valent vertices. So four valent, remember, just means four edges coming out of it. So it needs to look something like this. Moreover, it needs to project down homeomorphically. So the edges must project so that two edges go to A, one in, one out, and the same needs to be true for B. That means roughly it needs to look like an A coming out and an A coming in. The model is this little red circle here. And also there needs to be a B coming in and a B coming out. This is that local homeomorphism condition. 
And if you build any graph with all of the vertices having these properties, you build a cover. Let me give you an example. Here's a graph with two vertices. And I will make this loop here project to A. This edge project to B. This edge project to B. And I'll make this edge also project to A. And this has a map to the wedge of two circles specified by the labelings over there. So let me just convince you that this is a covering map. So, so let me just say like this yellow edge is going to project down to be like this. The A loops project in the obvious way, and everything matches up at the vertices. You can check that. Now, what, for example, maps to this open set here? Well, it's this set and this set. So this is looking like a double cover. And how about a point on B, so it has a neighborhood that looks like this purple set. And so this is like, actually let me, let me put it, uh, oops, like near the beginning, you'll, you'll get some more information out of that. So how about like this purple set? That purple set is basically the initial components of the B loops upstairs. It's like this, and like this. And then, of course, there's a neighborhood of the vertex that looks like this orange set, and that lifts to these two orange sets, and everything matches up as you would hope it to. So there you go. That's a double cover of the wedge of two circles by the wedge of three circles. This should be a little surprising. So remember, the wedge of three circles has fundamental group three, uh, the, the, fu the free group on three generators, whereas the wedge of two circles has fundamental group, the free group on two generators. Let's, let's build up to our fact here. So take a base point. in uh, the cover circled. So let me just say this will be my base point. Uh, you can get a generating set for the fundamental group. Then pi one of the graph above here with base point, this yellow point, is equal to the free group on three generators. And what are the generators? Uh, well, you can see what they project down to. There's one loop on the left given by A there's another loop given by B squared. I go on one B edge and then I come back on one other B edge. And then there's a third one given by follow the B on the bottom uh, and then take the A loop and then take B coming backwards. So that path, that picture is getting a little crowded, just redraw one of them. 
So there's a loop from this yellow base point, which looks like come down here, go around A, and then come backwards. And that's another um, generator for the fundamental group. But recall that P star from pi 1 of this graph with the yellow base point to pi 1 of this graph with this red base point is injective. So what does that mean? Well, then a b squared and b a b inverse generate a free group on three generators in the free group generated by A and B. So let me just sum this up in a corollary. The free group on three generators is a subgroup of the free group on two generators. That should be really weird to you and defy most of your intuitions. For example, you know, vector spaces of dimension three aren't subspaces of vector spaces of dimension two, but free groups are weird. In fact, it gets weirder than that. So we can generalize the above. So let GN be this space with the labelings. So I'm going to have a loop here, A. And now I'll have a loop going this way, B, loop coming back, B. A loop going out, A, a loop coming back, A. And so on and so forth. Let's alternate between Bs and As. And then at the very end, I'll have a B coming out, B going in, and a loop A. Oh, no, I want it to end on a B. So this is an A, an A, and that's a B. And you can do this for as many loops as you want. This is a cover of the wedge of two circles, as before. But it's weird because pi 1 of gn is going to be the free group on n generators. So I, I iterate this n times. Uh, yeah, so, so the n isn't clear here, but the n is the number of total loops in this graph. And again, this covers the wedge of two circles. So the corollary is that the free group on n generators is a subgroup of the free group of two generators for all natural numbers n. And that should be really, really weird. Uh, because, oh well, yeah, you can fit like the free group on a million generators right inside the free group on two generators. And if you wanted to, you could fix a base point and find exactly the elements that generate your fundamental group here. So it gets even weirder than that
So consider the following space. So it looks like a loop like this. It's going to be a bi-infinite graph. A, and there's a loop, well, a path that's going to project to the loop B, and A, and then A, B. And so let's make this go on forever that way, and it'll also go on forever the other way. Now, I'm going to call this G infinity. And I claim that this is a covering space of the free group on two generators. For example, let's, uh, so this here on the right is A. This on the left is B. The inverse image of a set like that is a disjoint union of sets which map homeomorphically onto it. And the inverse image of a set such as this is similarly a disjoint union of countably infinitely many intervals. And then you could also check things at the intersection here do the intersections look like X's yeah they do kind of curved out X's but nevertheless everything fits together as disjoint unions of homeomorphic pieces and our theorem didn't have anything about finiteness or anything like that. So here's the corollary. Since the fundamental group of G infinity is the free group on countably infinitely many generators, F infinity is a subgroup on the free group of two generators. And I think it's worth working out what the generators are here. So there's one generator, which looks like, I'll copy and paste this picture here. So one loop is given by this green loop here, say so this is going to be our base point, and that just projects down to A. There's another which looks like B A B inverse and there's another one which goes out a little farther and so that reads off b squared a b to the negative 2. And let's also see what's going on on the left there. There's a loop like this, which looks like b inverse a b. And hopefully we see what's going on here. This is the set. So the generators map to the set b to the n, a, b to the minus n, where n is an integer. And so I think this is very interesting. If you're just in the free group with two generators and you want to cook up a subset of that, which is as a group isomorphic to the free group on infinitely many generators, all you do is you fix an element a and you look at all of the conjugates of A by B. Those together 
have no relations between them, which I find somewhat surprising. Okay, so hopefully we've seen that there is something inside of covering spaces. They tell you some really deep facts about uh, groups. So let's delve deeper into some more general theory. So here's a natural question. Given a map phi from y to x, when does it lift to a map phi twiddle from y to x twiddle for a cover x twiddle of x. So let me just draw the diagram again that we usually see. Here's y. I have a map phi into x, and I want to know, is there some phi twiddle which makes this diagram commute? Uh, and it turns out to have a very nice and neat answer. Here's the proposition. Let P from X twiddle to X be a covering map. And let Y be a path connected and locally path connected. That just means every, every point has a neighborhood that's path connected. So then a map phi from y and a point y naught into x and a point x naught lifts to a map phi twiddle from y y naught to a given base point x twiddle x naught twiddle uh, if and only if the induced map on fundamental groups, if I just look at the whole image of the fundamental group of Y inside of X, this needs to lie inside of the image of the fundamental group of X twiddle inside of X. So let me just remind you that this is in pi one of X and this is in pi one of X. So it does make sense to ask for one to be a subset of the other. This is the main technical theorem of today and the proof is a little bit involved. One direction is easy though. So let's Assume there is a lift. So assume there is a lift. Oh, that's this way. Wait. No, that's this way. <laughs> so assume there is a lift. Phi twiddle. Well, then the following maps commute. I'll draw up the commutative diagram. It's pi one of y, y not. I can map this over by phi twiddle star to pi one of x twiddle, x not twiddle. There's also phi star that maps me over to pi one of x, x naught, and there's also p star, which takes me down. 
Well, now let's just read off the commutative diagram. This says, if I do p star twiddle, and then I do p star, this is equal to p star. Well, that's pretty much all there is to it. So p star is in the image of p star. The other direction is more involved and you should expect it to be. It's always harder to go from algebra to topology than going the other way. I mean, it's not 100% of the time, but that's the usual way it goes. So suppose uh, phi star is in the image of P star. Now recall the path lifting property. It just says for any path from I into X with F of zero equal to X naught and any choice of point X naught twiddle in the inverse image of a covering map. There exists a unique lift of F starting at X naught twiddle. Okay, now for every point y in y, choose a path, fy, so that f of 0 is equal to y naught, my chosen base point of y, and f of 1 is equal to y. So I can do this because my space is path connected. Since y is PC. Now, if I take this path and map it over with phi, so this is what I start with. I start with the map phi from y to x, and phi composed with fy is a path from x naught, well, phi composed with f of 0. So this is phi of y naught. We assume this is a based map, so that's x naught. And this goes to phi composed with f of 1, and so that's phi of y. Now remember what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to lift this to a map phi twiddle. So lift this path to a path phi composed with fy twiddle. So now this is a path inside of the covering space. Let me just draw a little picture to help us keep track of what's going on. I have a path here from y naught to y, and I map it over with phi, and it goes now from x naught to f of y, and I'm gonna have a lift phi composed with f to the covering space. I've picked out a particular base point here. Ah, lift this to a path phi composed with fy twiddle starting at my chosen lift x naught twiddle.
And now I can look at where this path ends. So we define phi twiddle of y to be equal to phi composed with fy at 1. So when I lift this path, I'm going to define this to be phi twiddle of y. So there's a couple things to worry about here. First, is that phi twiddle is well defined. Why should I be worried about this? Well, I should be worried because I I started with an arbitrary choice of a path, and I need to show that that choice of path does not matter. So suppose f and f prime are two paths from y naught to y. Then f prime composed with f bar is a loop based at y naught. So this is the usual picture. I have two paths. This one is f. This is f prime. I can follow f prime and then do f bar. This should be multiplication, not compose. And, that, and that's a loop. OK. Now remember our assumption. The image of any loop, phi star of f prime times f bar, is in the image of p. So it's in p star of pi 1 of x twiddle, x naught twiddle. So then phi composed with f prime times f bar is homotopic to some loop of the form p composed with g, where g is a loop based in x naught twiddle. The assumption up here tells me that the homotopy class of any loop coming from phi is really p of some loop in x twiddle. So that's how I get that equality. So now I have p composed with g is going to be homotopic to phi composed with f prime times f bar. And it's not too hard to see that this is just equal to phi times f prime producted with phi times f bar. And now if I compose with p composed with f on both sides, we get phi composed or p composed with g times phi composed with f is homotopic to phi composed with f prime. Now these are paths, just so we keep track of what we're doing, the paths from x naught to f of y. 
Now, by the uniqueness of path lifting, these lift, the so lifts starting at x naught twiddle end at the same point. Now, the lift of P composed with G is just G, of course. And this is a loop based at X naught twiddle. So, uh, from before, I have phi composed with f prime twiddle of 1 uh, by the homotopicity. <laughs> since the fa since uh, both of these uh, paths are homotopic, we learned that their lifts end at the same point. So phi composed with f prime at 1, when I lift that up, is the same thing as... Okay, the lift of P composed with G, that's G, times the lift of phi composed with F at 1. But G is a loop, right? So what this says is, spin, G, G says spin around in a circle and then do phi composed with F. So... This is just the same thing as phi composed with f of 1. And that was our definition of phi twiddle of y. We took two possibly different paths, and now we've shown that their endpoints are the same. So phi twiddle of y is independent of the choice of path. And our other claim, which we're not going to prove, is that phi twiddle is continuous. This actually is it's not too bad, and it's in Hatcher, but uh, I'll just hint that you use the continuity of phi and evenly covered neighborhoods. And this is where we need the local path connected condition. Those are the main techniques. So that's going to do it for that proof. We've constructed some lift, and it's quite obvious that if I do P on the phi twiddle, it ends up being phi. So here's the next question. How about uniqueness? Well, here's a proposition we'll end with without proof, but given a covering space P from X twiddle to X and a map phi from Y to X if two lifts phi one twiddle and phi two twiddle of phi agree at a single point of y and if y is connected then phi one twiddle and phi two twiddle agree on all of y. So there's this condition that they agree at a point. That shouldn't be too surprising. Remember, when we lift paths, we have a choice of where to lift zero. But once we make the choice of where to lift zero, the entire rest of the path is determined. And what this is saying is, it's true more generally. If I choose two lifts of 
a map V on any space Y, it's unique after I've chosen a lift of a single point. So that's going to do it for today. Next class, we are going to delve even deeper into the theory of covering spaces. We're going to start the classification of all covering spaces. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.